Today we're very lucky, instead of a lecture, to have a conversation with uh, Professor Caroline Wanjuku Kihaku, the author of this wonderful book, Migrant Woman of Johannesburg, one of the most important books in the last decade on, on Johannesburg, but particularly on, on the migrant experience. Prof. Kihato has, uh, has a very um, rich publication and research experience, but presently she's an affiliate of the African Center for Migration and Society at WITS, um, the Department of International Development at the University of Oxford, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The chapter on urban ga governance in Migrant Women uh, was particularly important for me because it helps really rethink urban governance away from a state perspective, but also rethink um, the, the claim to the right to the city away from formal civic movements. Perhaps you could start with reflecting back on, on how this perspective uh, links more broadly to, to urban theory around the right to the city. Thank you, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be here and, um, and to um, have this conversation with you. I mean, I think for me, one of the things that um, is really interesting about some of the research that I did was really coming to terms with this idea that, um, that African cities are in a crisis, that, they're, that they are um, unregulated, that the, that the government is just unable to provide any services or um, or um, that that you know or or that is able to control its populations and control the growth and 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 what was interesting to me when I was looking um, when I went when I was doing my research was really understanding that actually we've got it all wrong that idea that this this city has has um, is is in crisis that is unregulated just doesn't fit the the empirical data that we saw, um, and that actually urban spaces um, are extremely highly regulated even when the the state is not um, present, and um, and 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 just understanding women's migrant women's sort of. Um, everyday practices um, for how they went around in the city, how they accessed um, services, ho shelter, um, 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 e the economy, the informal economy, and how they used that to survive, um, really is cause for pause in terms of trying to understand what the right to the city then means. So, you know, we kind of often think that the right to the city is provided by government because, you know, the, you know it, the government regulates who has the right and who hasn't. What we see with these migrant women is, is how they navigate this, these rights um, outside of the ambit of formal governance. So I think that, that links to, we had a number of questions from students around really thinking about urban governments. I'm just going to, to read a few of them. So one is, what is meant by the state-centric understanding of urban governance and what are the multiple governance and regulatory processes in cities used to define urban territory? This links to another key question which came up a lot is, um, is about the notion of, of the uncaptured urbanite and how the, the notion of the uncaptured urbanite speaks to, to the relation of, of, um, of urban governance. So maybe you could speak to those questions a bit. I think one of the ways in which we've understand, uh, understood the modern state is, and its, and its growth has really come out of this, this understanding that governments control populations. And you know when we speak, when we talk about um, when we read Foucault and the idea of governmentality, that the state orders um, um, populations in certain ways in order to provide you know state services, whether it's hospitals or or um, or schools or you know prisons you know that that they, that they the idea of the modern state was this 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 notion that populations could be controlled and this and and the and the government could act upon um these populations and 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 order them in the way in which they um they needed to 
and and what we see in African cities is that um, this 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 sort of evolution of the modern state hasn't happened in this way, in the way in which Western uh, states uh, modern states have evolved. And what we see there is is um, a lot more um, laissez a lot more laissez fairness. Like there's a lot more. Um, E ways of um, maneuvering outside of, of government. Let's talk about the informal econ economy, for example. It's completely, oftentimes, it's it's completely out of the purview of government in the sense that it's it's controlled by local actors. The government is unable to kind to to tax people, for example, in these in these contexts. Um, oftentimes even accessing places like informal informal settlements like Kibera or whatever by the state is often almost impossible physically accessing these states. So, so the state-centric model really doesn't fit the African um, urban model. And, and, and that's what I really meant is that, we, you know, we, we oftentimes use these concepts that have developed in other societies without really understanding how or whether those concepts really apply to the societies in which um, we are working in, which are kind of developing contexts where the state has, has emerged out of a very different kind of process, it's colonization, you know, and, and, and um, yeah, and the, uh, yeah. So, so that's what I meant by state centric, um, and and the fact that we can't really apply that understanding of governance as state centric into the into the um, cities that we study in 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 the global south. Linked to that is this idea of the uncaptured urbanite, right? You know, we look at the if if we think if we understand the modern state as as um, this Weberian understanding where you know everyone has a, a, a you know a residential address, a tax number, you know, and everyone an ID. Everyone is kind of you know known to by the state in these very very critical um, um, ways. Um, if we look at um, migrant women in Johannesburg, particularly those who are undocumented or whose documents really um, are, who, who kind of suspended in link, legal limbo in, these, in, this, um, in the city. Then, you know, they, they, see, they seem to be uncaptured by the state because we don't, you know, they don't have IDs, they don't have real addresses that where we can find them, they don't have tax numbers that, you know, and, 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 this is not just a, a, a problem of, of, of migrant women, it's also a problem generally um, of, of our cities. And informality really challenges this idea um, that, that, that all populations are visible to the state. Um, so, so that's what I meant by the uncaptured urbanized. We have a group of people who, who are able to kind of maneuver themselves between, st between um, state regulations outside of the state purview and and really find a, a, a way of surviving and ending in the city that that is not state centric let's see so i think that brings us to our next broad theme um uh, which is particularly the the gender experience or the intersectional dimension connecting the migrant experience and the gendered experience. So there's a number of questions around that. I'll read a few. So how are migrant women meant to survive being in the city legally if they are denied basic things like getting a job, opening a bank account, etc. cetera? And, and another question raised the point is that even with the Section 22 permit and legal status, often de facto asylum seekers are, are denied. Um, and then there was a, a question about mobility and, and the relationship of mobility to freedom. Does saying that migrant women are mobile not romanticize their situation in a way? Because for me, mobility relates to freedom of movement, which is a right, something they do not have access to as migrants, and in some ways a choice, which I feel they do not have. There's one more question, which I think speaks to it. On, on the one side, not having refugee status in legal documents, allowing these women to exist and partake lawfully in societies determined 
is detrimental to their ride to the city. But on the other, their invisibility also helps them move around and avoid certain legal issues. And as, as shown in the, the case of, of Hannah. Yeah, oh, those, are, those are questions that you can, you know, take hours and hours trying to respond to or think through and I and and I certainly I don't say, I don't have all the answers I mean I think for me what I took away from this research and what I took away from my experience with 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 um, the women that I that I worked with um, was this idea that they had agency you know so th the idea that I mean a lot of our literature just talks about you know victim you know how migrant women are victims if they you know a lot of um, people who uh, you know challenge a lot of people kind of fighting for the rights of migrants for example um, talking about their right to bank accounts their right to being uh, to having ID documents and, and all this because they you know because these are the things that they need to survive and 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 it got me thinking about well let's look at how these women who are kind of the, in this suspended uh, state of limbo legal limbo how are they actually managing to access um means for their for their livelihoods and part of the reason they are able to access that is because of their invisibility so the fact that they are invisible to the state like for example Hannah you know she I was there she gave an ID she didn't have an ID so nobody could look her up where does she live where, where was she born who are her people we don't know she gave an, ad an address and I was like I tried to follow up with it and I was like where exactly in the city is that um, and precisely because of the fact that they're uncap uncaptured, precisely because of the fact that they uh, that that they can play this in game of invisibility, that gives them an edge to that 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 gives them certain advantages in the city, right? On the other, this is where the paradox is. On the other hand, they're unable to access um, the broad rights to the city you know, that are given to those who are citizens, that are given to those who have, you know, who have IDs, who, who qualify for certain, for certain um, services. And so, and so it's really about trying to understand um, what does the right to the city mean when in some cases being invisible ensures that you are safe and that you have that you can na navigate certain rights or certain forms of access which you couldn't if you weren't um invisible and this is really a question we need to ask um and it's not something that we can always resolve um and and let's and i, I also i'm not sure that that um that the students have read um one of the other chapters where i met i met a woman and she said you know because I was saying you're invisible, you know, you've got a right, you've got, a, you can, you're a refugee, you can really claim, and you need to do this and this. And she says, um, the reason, you know, how I survive because I hide, I hide from my government, I hide from my people, you know, I hide from, you know, this the South African government. I, um, uh, and that's precisely how I survive. And we've got to figure out, well, does the right to the city mean this kind of hiding, this kind of, uh, this kind of invisibility? And, and then how does it shift how we understand what the right to the city is, which is about claiming rights of people who can be seen and be fought for on behalf of, or who fight for themselves, you know, as in this very, very public um, sphere. So it's a question. I don't know. I mean, maybe your students might come up with something that is more exciting than 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 I did. But I was. But it really, you know, it really shifted the way I understand rights, mm -hmm. um, particularly from the perspective of those who whose whose very survival requires um, this kind of invisibility. Let's not champion. Let's let's keep them on the down low so that we don't we don't upset the upper cart and and get make them visible. That visibility oftentimes means that they are, you know, it's, it, it, they're sort of susceptible to being, you know, seen in ways that they don't want to be seen.
I think this links also to a number of questions which were around what the state response should be to these insights. Should there be a kind of regional uh, response, you know, increase free movement of, of labor within Africa? Um, but also the question of, uh, of xenophobia and the notion of the, the, you know, rise in xenophobic tensions in South Africa, but also in the US and elsewhere. Do you think a more regional response to these issues? Or is there a way in which municipal governments can engage the, you know, the uncaptured urbanite in a more, in a more meaningful way? Yeah. I mean, I think I am a firm believer in um, open borders, regional borders that I don't, I, you know, and maybe it's an ideological thing, but I think for me that it would be a lot safer for migrant women, for anybody moving across, con, you know, across national borders um, on the continent, if, if it were legal. You know, otherwise we get all these, you know, um, all these sort of corrupt practices and 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 the and the smuggling and you know, otherwise this becomes sort of such an underground and and quite nasty business um, because the laws, you know, because of its illegality. If 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 all if the regional response and it's not just the Southern African region, if the African regional response would be that anyone is safe to move, you know, everyone, as long as you have some documentation, you're safe to move and, 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 and get domicile in whatever country you are. And, you know, then it would remove the, the real danger that a lot of women particularly face um, crossing borders. I want to just bring back to one final question about the specificity of, of the experience of, of women and, you know, the intersectional dimension and in, in what sense, the migrant experience is, is one also shared by, by men who are also subject to these forms of harassment. But I, I think for sure, I mean, for sure, the, a lot of the experiences migrant women face are faced by men too, right? You know, they're harassed in the streets, you know, their, their stuff is confiscated by, by um, Metro cops. You know, the struggle is real in, in, and in very real ways for, so there's, there's a common struggle that migrants face, um, whether men or women, but there are also specific struggles faced by women and specific res responsibility, gender responsibilities that, that add, uh, that have added layers to women's experience. For I mean, for example, in that chapter of um, that I write about the home and domesticity and and raising children and how and how this really impacts on women's ability to, you know, to 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 move to, uh, you know, to so to support their children, particularly if they're single women. You know, how do you support children and try and you know sell on the street you know and all that so there's there's that too and then of course we know the kind of levels of violence that women face in south africa generally and and how this is shared too by other by women um by south african women too and and this is this this layers the particular experience of women in very in very nuanced in ways that that um are sometimes very similar to, to men's experiences, but in ways that are not, um, um, because women in cities, whether you, whether you're a migrant or not, a woman in Johannesburg is a you know has very specific um, encounters with danger that are not necessarily always um, male uh, male experiences. So uh, so. You know, so I really tried to, I mean, not, I didn't make the comparison in very, um, in, very vividly, but I really tried to kind of nuance how women's, women's ways of being in the city and experiences of the city really shaped how, how, how they saw it rather than how the male gaze would, 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 would see it. Um, and the male experiences experience would 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 um, experience it, and and that's what I was really trying to bring out. And part of it was also 
really focusing on domest- on the domestic home and what that meant to women and how and how important that was this kind of private space was in the city we rarely talk about private space in the city because cities are supposed to be these public arenas where we you know where we encounter strangers and where we and where we have public discourse um, and so yeah, and so I was kind of trying to layer those what it meant for for women in the city generally. And I suppose we could extend that analysis as as some of our colleagues at ACMS have done to also looking at uh, migration and queer communities. Absolutely, absolutely, and and that's what, I mean. That's where the study of the city has to be um, um, seen through these perspectives of so-called minorities right or or so-called people who are not normal or you know so you know considered normal because that's how we that's how the city then looks back at us and says you know that's how we begin to question what 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 city means what rights mean you know it's not just right housing rights for everybody you know if if you there are so many layered rights that we need to kind of uncover and see how the city includes or excludes um different difference and different kinds of people so yeah so one final question on on um the covid 19 pandemic and in johannesburg well there's lots of reports among those i'm speaking to of, of, of um cross-border migrants and undocumented migrants also asylum seekers being excluded from food support from care that the state regulations have excluded them. So there's one question linked to that. How do you think the current pandemic will affect societal and disciplinary codes for migrants as the state is claiming to be looking out for citizens first? Do you think the current pandemic will further the divide between the state and urban dwellers, especially considering the role that migrants play in urban governance? I think the, that's a good question. Um, and thanks to your student for asking that. I don't know that I have a, a, a an answer, but but I know what I what I think, and what we are already seeing is that uh, um, is that COVID nineteen has created this. Um, it has created. Uh, it has sort of allowed governments to do things that they would not have been allowed to do with you know, and it has allowed um, governments to. To, con- to create this very this disciplinary cause against people that they do not, or that against marginalized populations, let's just say that generally. I mean, look at how the responses, not only in South Africa, but almost across African cities, the responses towards the poor have been the most um, sort of violent and aggressive and oppressive. You know, it's really curtailed the rights of people who are you know, who just are unable, who are, who are not middle class, right? And, and, and I think that um, particularly when it comes to policing, you know, certain bodies in the city, you know, migrant bodies, um, poor people, you know, poor bodies, marginalized community bodies, it's, it's really given, you know, it's given governments a lot of power to do that to do um and uh, you know <laughs> and it's so but what really um is the contradiction here is that especially for in africa this covid 19 was introduced by middle class people who move who are, were able to move from one continent to another and bring it into the city so rather so rather than police those kinds of uh, bodies where uh, where is where where is the state action most felt it's actually most felt in 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 the poorer areas which would be protected so i don't know i just think that that we are living in an era where we have there's you know there's all this that our differences are becoming the reason we um we exclude you know we exclude and and i don't know when the time will come when we see we begin to see difference again as as benefit as as in as a useful 
as as useful as as an advantage rather than a disadvantage um as a as a way of being more creative um, and opening up but it's it seems to me that we've swung you know we're swinging towards the sort of very we're closing in we're kind of closing in on our we're corralling our communities and protecting ourselves and hopefully this swing comes back again and 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 we open up a little bit more i hope so but um so caroline thank you so much for your your time and you've given us both in your work and the conversation a lot to to think about and discuss further in, in tutorials. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and all the best to you and the students and Thanks. take care.